Yeah, so while they're moving that over, the I brought this down just because, so like, give me this giant, giant list of things to cover, right? From you name it, you know, X point, the future of memory, so on. Um, and so I thought, <laughs> thought I'd bring this one in, right? Just sort of for those, you know, people like about stuff being future proof, right? Can, can we just ask what was so secret on the blank whiteboard that you had to cover it up? <laughs> <laughs> the whiteboard itself. <laughs> we need to reflect too much and we don't want it to be a distraction. Yeah. I'm going to run into it. I probably won't run out of pens. Um, the, you know, people have been saying for ages, they're like, well, what are you going to do when flash goes away and it goes to, you know, RERAM or X point or whatever? And the answer is, well, you know, yeah, we, 10 years ago, we already had that one built, right? This was motherboard number one, right? And this was just DRAM. Um, now, and yeah, the, the, the rumor at the last SFD, I did, in fact, do the PCB layout for this in PowerPoint on a vacation rather than being down on the beach with the rest of the family. Um, and that's not because you, it's so easy, right? Because there's 250 buses and 50,000 traces, right? It, and only, you know, 12 layers, no layer changes, no blind vias, you know. And the answer is, yeah, that's because that's of, you know, it's a good design. Um, but the DRAM box that this was, right, is still, in a sense, in the current architecture. <clears throat> flash protocol that we use runs over the DRAM. So yeah, if, if suddenly X point was the way to go, we just take out stuff and we'd already have built it. Unfortunately, right, that's not going to happen because like most phase change memories, which is what X point is, um, it'll melt if you try to run a storage box built out of it. That's leaving aside the fact that actually running persistent memory out of, uh, you know, byte memory is actually a much more complicated problem than, than people consider because you actually have to deal with, well, you know, when it goes out, what kind of transactions was I half in the middle of and what will it look like when I come back? And, you know, this is actually a sort of rather difficult problem in computer science to get right. Um, but it can be done if it didn't melt. But, you know, everything I've seen suggests that, you know, you're going to need probably water cooling or something if you tried to run this box with X point instead of DRAM. Um, so, I was trying to figure out how to start off on all this and get through all the points. You know, I sort of needed one topic or so to coalesce everything into. And I decided I was going to sort of riff on presentation from yesterday. And I was just going to generalize, right, instead of it being, you know, lies that flash storage company tells, I figured I would just do lies that storage companies tell. Um, well, there's a lot more of those. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but conveniently, some of the good ones will actually be, I'll be able to use to actually get, cover most of the topics at the same time. Um, you know, so there's the usual, you know, whatever we don't have, you don't need, right? And whatever we do have is all that you need. And the corollary to that is whatever the competitor doesn't have, right, is exactly why you shouldn't buy their box, even if you don't need it. Um, the other one, which is, which is a very popular topic, is, right, commodity hardware is always better than proprietary custom, unless, of course, we've built proprietary custom. Um, and no one should ever build flash controllers because you can't possibly keep up and there's no benefit except when we build them, right? Um, the other one which, I, which is, which is um, an issue and, and sort of is why I was, you know, um, I'm not sorry for it, but I apologize for jumping on you on the inline uh, dedupe is, is that, you know, people come up with these sort of numbers that don't make sense, right? In other words, the, the statements they make, right, sort of not consistent. It's like, you know, that's nice latency and that's nice IOPS and that's nice bandwidth, right? Except that you can't get, you know, any, all three of them at once. You probably can't even get two of them at the same time, right? So the, the notion of what is it that something is um, versus data sheet versus the, what the actual customer sees. You know, and of course there's always, the, there's, you know, there's the way we do it, there's the straw man and there isn't possibly any third or fourth way to solve the problem, that, you know, and so things like, yeah, the only way to do it is with an, you know, an Intel CPU. Intel CPUs are great. They're awesome for computing, right? Again, this box is 10 years old. You'll note that there's no processors here. <coughs> was direct PCIe attached, right? We've already been there, right? It's cool, um, but Intel CPUs are not meant for throwing data around as much as they keep trying to add stuff to them. They're meant to do computing, right? That's why they're a general purpose processor. Um, Moving lots of data is, is not actually good for them. Um, you know, they have these things called caches that don't like having, you know, most of the DRAM bandwidth run through them continuously with no actual reuse. It, 
you should see what the cache hit rate is, right, in certain cases. Right, when the cache hit rate in an Intel CPU is not measured in 90 something, the answer is you have a couple hundred megahertz processor, not a gigahertz processor, <coughs> right? Um, the other one, which is, which is fascinating, it's always, you know, no one needs more IOPS than whatever it is we have until we have more, right? Um, this is, of course, you know, without any relation to say how big it is, what you want to do with it, um, the notion that, yes, the answer is it's a million IOP box, but you don't want to run it, you don't want to run anything at, a, at 100%, right? Well, when, when the systems were so slow that you wouldn't notice the added queuing delay because you were running at 100%, it was fine, right? When you run this thing at the, you know, not this thing, this thing, right, at the speed which is 100% for our competitors, then it does run at, you know, 100, 150 microsecond latency. Yeah, I don't want to run it at a million IOPS, but if it couldn't run at a million IOPS, then you can't run it at 25% load and get that kind of performance. Um, which also gets back to things like, you know, what do people do with them? It's like, you know, no one needs 4K IOPS except when they need 512 IOPS, except when they want 32K. Because of course, that's what the applications do, but that's not what the applications do. Or rather, the applications do do it because that's what they did for disk, not because it's a good thing, right? Um, yeah, and specifically on the 32K, it's, well, that's what the average is. We don't actually do any 32K IOPS. We do a lot of 8Ks and a lot of 64Ks. Right. And, and even again, out to 32. And then even the 8Ks, again, we do because that was better than doing 4Ks on a disk system. <laughs> right. There are very few cases where, again, you're going to win in the long term with larger and larger IOPS because you almost certainly didn't need all that extra data you were forced to bring in. Right. Um, and there's a lot of you know, SQL studies and so on. They're like, yeah, it runs better at 4K you know, on a flash system because you're not pushing data around that you need to push around, right? And it adds up. Um, you know, and again, what do I need all this, all this IOPS for? Well, you wanted to replicate it, right? That means the other box is writing. So unless that other box was a data center that didn't actually do work, they both had their local load and they had their replication load. Oh, you mean you're gonna only just use that box as a dead end, you weren't actually doing any work in the other data center. Okay, well, then you gotta buy another box to get the IOPS that you didn't have. Which is another thing that, that, again, comes from, in the disk world, in order to get more IOPS, you had to buy more physical hardware, right? More performance mm. cost money because you had to buy more electric motors. This notion that if it's fast, right, it must, you know, if it has the performance of the Ferrari, it must have the cost of the Ferrari, right? So, would anyone care to guess how much it would cost to make this box, you know, twice as fast and half the latency as it is now? Ten times as much. Uh, actually, it would be cheaper. Right? Because what's, what's, the reason I only go to a million apps is not limited by anything that, you know, I can run up a couple of clocks, in fact, take some CPUs out. Remember I was saying about the Intel CPUs are not good for data? Right? I'd actually be better off with a single socket system that they can interconnect so bad that it's not worth having. Um, the other one which I love, which relates to the performance, is always, you know, be, only because of our fancy technology does our flash not, the flash not wear out. No, it's because your thing is so slow you can't actually get more than about a drive right a day on the array that it doesn't wear out. You could do whatever you wanted. Um, and the one with all, which is where I'm going to sort of spend most of the rest of my time, um, related also to the Intel CPUs, is, you know, we have this fantastic novel, you know, reinvented radar, you know, system, and that's why everything is wonderful. Of course, in most of these cases, they didn't, it's neither is it wonderful, nor did they invent it. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people at NetApp who, you know, probably took some exception to all of the XDP claims about their wonderful rebuild, because I'm pretty sure that was what dual parity array did, you know, the moment it came out. Um, the recent DSD announcement of, you know, this, First true cubic raid, of course, there is no such thing, so I don't know what it means to be a true cubic raid, except they talk about how there's nothing in the data path. So, so where's the raid get done? Right? Oh wait, so you must be running it in software on the host, which means it's single only, and how on earth does that raid, you know, even produce those numbers? Much less the fact that, again, there are wonderful claims about being able to do all this rebuild. It's like, they should again go talk to some folks at IBM who did that in even odd raid 20 years ago, right? Um, 
everything old is new again. Everything is old is new again, um, which is why, you know, that's why we don't do, you know, RAID 6 or, you know, erasure codes or so on, right? We use something really old, right? We call it VRAID, was basically RAID 3 with tweaks. Now, you've gotten shown some of this, right? Good thing you don't have to worry about synchronizing the spindles. Well, you know, it's funny you should say that because that's one of the things we do. And again, it comes back to being able to both have the performance without having to pay for the performance. We do, in a sense, synchronize the spindles. Yeah, but solid state spindles are a lot easier to synchronize. Ah, but you have to be able to, which comes also back to why. So, you know, the question was asked earlier, you know, what's the connection? And so you gave sort of the, the simple answer. And that's sort of why, you know, sort of, I, I apologize for jumping all over you on the definition of, of inline, although I'm not sorry for it, because the problem is that in this, this industry, right, you say something and it gets, you know, wildly exploited by people. If you, you know, give people the truth, they go and they run with it. Um, so the interconnect between here, right, again, it's proprietary and it gives us all sorts of benefits, um, which is why we both built it and continue to use it. Um, and so if I could tell you, you know, how fast it runs, um, it runs at 250 megahertz. Right? I remember when that was fast. Yeah. But it still does a million IOPS, right? But, you know, now that I've said that, I'm sure people will go and make fun of it somehow, right? Except, again, it's, I'm getting from a system with 1 20th the clock speed, you know, four times the performance of somebody with a 6 gigabit SAS, right? Um, and that's what I say that commodity parts, commodity standards, and, you know, Intel CPUs are, are not necessarily a good deal, nor are they the way to go. Um, so just to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same board before I go and trash a couple other things, the, what we do, right, is a CPU complex, and it talks to an HPA, right? As you just saw there, we have you know, four RAID controllers. Um, the joy or benefit of RAID controllers is they do, a, one of the things they do for you is they take out all those interrupts of all the little pieces parts. They also prevent you from having to deal with all the pieces parts coming back at random times. Right? And say so we do actually synchronize the spindles. Um, there's two things we get out of the, the VRAID, which is essentially RAID 3. We get the erase hiding, which is we do because we, since we control the, the VIMs underneath it, when the 4K comes down and gets split up, right, into little 1K chunks, they wind up in the DRAM on the VIM, but they only, each VIM has a window that it writes in, okay? And so when it comes time to read the data, of the five, it's guaranteed that only one of them is busy doing read, writes or erases, which, is, which blocks up the flash. And so the other four can produce the data for, to recover it. But in terms of the overall performance and the long-term performance and the where and how fast can I go and long-term how fast can I go, and that matters because you know, if you look at the capacity of flash, right, its growth curve is way better than the performance curve growth of Intel CPUs. Right? If you're going to try to brute force keeping up with flash density, you're, you're going to lose that battle. Um, you know, right now, the answer is people came down, the processors, you know, it's one of those ones where people try to extrapolate a point as opposed to a curve, right? We've been doing this for 10 years. I've been watching these curves for a while. The, right now, you can get a, something built out of, you know, straight off the, off the shelf CPUs and SSDs, and they go really good. They're not going to get much faster, right? There's, there's fundamental limitations in the way basically everyone else runs stuff. The flash is going to get bigger. The, the SSDs and the CPUs are not going to get faster, right? And what you're going to wind up with is a bigger and bigger milkshake and a tinier and tighter straw, right? And when you try to go and take your whole data center and put it into a rack, and that rack is still only running at a couple hundred thousand IOPS, but that rack now contains petabytes, right, and not tens of terabytes, you're going to not really be happy about the solution. So, again, people always, you know, they make fun of it. They'd be like, why are you splitting this up, you know, four plus one and so on? Well, if you look at the total overall work we do here, you do a write, it comes in, we write 5K, right? 25% overhead of the actual write to the flash. 
But that's also the, the limit of what winds up being having to actually be written, right? It's a 25% it's a expansion. Now on the vim, right, if you sort of look at the, the time slots, as it were, right, that it's got five slices. In one of them, it's busy doing writing, okay? We got write amplification. In this case, say about two. So half of that write time is writing whatever the user sent me. And half of that write time is writing stuff which I had to garbage collect, right? I had to read the stuff for that garbage collection at some point, right? So I got sort of 10% of my time writing new stuff, 10% of my time writing garbage collection stuff, 10% of my time reading stuff to do garbage collection, right? So that's about 30% of my available, you know, window before I come back around. It's actually kind of convenient, right? 70, 30, right? Mix being kind of standard, right? So I've, that works out pretty good. Um, it also works out from a where point of view in the sense of, can I use TLC or heck, you know, our buddies at Toshiba finally just announced that the 3D NAND is actually so good that they're going to do QLC, which is going to have about what TLC used to have for the endurance. So the question is, can you use that? How much write amplification do you produce in a system? And this is, again, one of those ones where people play lots of games. So I'm going to take this one down kind of deep and explain why it matters, because if you know, I have enough of a, mul a multiple advantage over you architecturally, the answer is, you can't use that, I can. Right? You want to have the density and the price? Well, that's nice, except you actually will wear out if you try to use that stuff. Um, I've been wanting to use TLC for a long time. The problem is that they kept building it for cell phones and not for data storage. Right? So they wouldn't actually make it 50% larger on the same die. They would make a die with exactly the same size <coughs> that was slightly smaller. And the price advantage wasn't that good. And they wouldn't package it in, you know, a cell phone guys pack. buy a lot more flash than you do. I'm not suggesting that I'm a better market for them. I'm just saying that the point is that the TLC was not actually packaged, right, to be beneficial for Flash, right? I think they've finally sort of gotten around to saying, okay, we're going to make this stuff bigger now. Well, that's good as long as you can use it. So the problem is if you're running, say, RAID 6 or dispersion codes or so on, you've got a fundamental limit here, right? In other words, if I, if I go this fast, and I suck up the time. You go and you do your write. So in RAID 6 one, same thing happens. Except in order to make that work, you're going to do a write. It's got to read from the target. It's got to read from the parity. It's got to read from the queue. Those are all going to come up to your Intel CPU, which means they all got to cross, at some point, your bottleneck bus. They all got to go into the DRAM. They all got to pass through the cache. Then they get pulled out and processed. Then they get sent back. So first off, I'm going to, you know, if you would give me 4K, I'm going to write 4K here, and I'm going to write 4K to the parity, and I'm going to write 4K to the Q. So first off, you're going to write 12K to my 5, OK? Just in terms of where. But it's worse than that. Because when we write this, it writes across the whole stripe, OK? And the parity, the parity hence belongs with the data. In a RAID 6, those parity are touched not just by you, but by everyone else in that stripe. And so the amount of data that changes, right? In, the, in an actual large data center, right, my daily change probably touched 10 or 15% of the data. If I'm going to do a good garbage collection, right, separate out the hot and the cold, get better behavior, well, that works up to a limit, right? You can't change a lot of the stuff and have hot, cold garbage collection work. Here, I'm only changing 10, 20%, right? I'm kind of pushing the limit, but it's, it's there. Here, if you change 10% of the data, right, you're actually touching 30%. And you're touching, the, the extra 20% is unrelated. In other words, those parity may correspond to one guy who's hot and the other people in that stripe may be cold on their SSDs. And so you're contaminating 30%. And the answer is you can't do hot cold garbage collection when you're touching 30% of the space. Which means they're not getting, at the lower level, they're not getting two to one. They're looking at three or four. Right? So first they're writing two and a half times as much physically to the SSD. And then the SSD is writing two or three times as much. Right? And so in the end, the answer is I'm actually, you know, the reason we don't worry about where is because we actually are touching the flash about 
10% as much <clears throat> as people using an SSD and a RAID 6 system. Um, so, you know, yeah, if the QLC stuff they package right, you know, I'll be happy to use it because we can run that. That's the other one. People talk about, you know, we can do tiering, right? And again, this is, yeah, if, if you only buy SSDs, tiering means I got to have some QLC SSDs and some MLC or some other kind of SSDs. And if you're running the flash, the answer is you're already tiered however you want to be, right? If, you know, the way that people used to run TLC in the old days, although it's going to change with some of the 3D, is first everything got written into blocks in the TLC that were run in SLC mode. And then it would go and collect those up and stick them into the TLC. But if you ran the controller, you could just decide to take some percentage of the blocks and keep them in SLC mode just to use for hot stuff. Right? I could tier within the thing, and I could tune that. Right? Wanted to do that, but again, they, they wouldn't. They wouldn't package. The, they package the TLC for the cell phone guys, right? When they package the stuff for the data storage guys. So the point is that the note again. This gets back to this notion that somehow fast is expensive, right? But it's not. When you're dealing with a piece of silicon, the answer is fast is just have I got a better algorithm, right? Have I got a better interconnect, particularly a better interconnect, because. As I said, right, if you run all this stuff through the CPU, it's, it's ugly, right? It's, you know, the answer is you can, right? Um, I could go a lot faster, right? If you'd stop telling people that they don't need, you know, a million D to biops, right? That would be pretty easy to produce, except if you tell someone that and they're like, oh, it must be expensive because it goes fast. <sighs> you know, what? Um, the problem is that it's, again, I don't necessarily want to go a million IOPS all the time. In fact, I, I kind of never want to go 100%, but I got to have that around for when I have a problem. Like, so, you know, Steve's comment about the, the you know, recently announced uh, flash blade, right? Sounds really cool, right? You know, 50 terabytes on one blade, and it's got, you know, look at all that back end interconnect, and what is it got, you know, Erasure codes across the thing run out of the CPUs. Yeah, let's discuss that, shall we? Right, so each one of those blades has got 50 terabytes. It's a lot of flash back here. And it's got two spigots, 10 gigs. So I'll be nice and say that it gets a gigabyte of actual bandwidth off of each one, right? So that's like two gigabytes a second. That's 50 terabytes. You want to rebuild one of these? It'll take you seven hours at 100% load of the entire array. Well, right. I didn't go to their event earlier in the week, but if they're not stupid, it's not a, it's a many to many, not a many to one rebuild. No, no, you understand. You know, it's, you have to put it back on, right? It's not. It doesn't matter where it gets done. It's got to be put back into the one that's failed, right? It will take you seven hours to pump yeah, fifty but terabytes but in. You, but if you rotate stripes around the modules, you don't bottleneck because you're not rebuilding to one. You're re rebuilding many to many. No, no, no. okay. I've got a box, right, I've got all the, the rays. This one dies, I take it out, I put it back in. Right, you have to put the stuff back on that one. No, I don't. Well then, what, is it gonna sit empty? It, the implication I, is you write to it over time. Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no um, time Rebuild. constraint on repopulating that one because I've already rebuilt across all of the other ones. So what you're saying is that I'm gonna keep space that I'm not gonna let the user have on all the other ones. That's more of an issue. Right. Yes. You know, okay. So you're gonna pay for space that I'm never gonna let you use right, to get around that. But, which is exactly the same as having a hot, it's, it's the same amount of space as if I had a hot spare module, but it rebuilds much faster. The, you, know, you, owe, you, you never wanna have a storage system that doesn't have enough free space to rebuild. Well, depends, what's the point, how do you say, if you're gonna run erasure code, right, I've got three spares in a sense already in the system, right? In other words, if you're, gonna, if you're going to go and say, I'm going to rebuild into that, then the answer is that's like having four. Right? So now I've got you know, four spares out of the I'm a the storage 12. guy. I'm paranoid. I'm just saying, right? You know, again, the answer is you've you got to put that up there. Right? But the same thing happens then again. Now I want to go and I want to write to this. Right? It's erase your code run through that bottleneck. Right? So you want to do a 4K write, it's got to go and get three reads of the other parts of the erasure code and write them back. Well, we assume it's a log structured write in. No, no, but it's got, I'm talking about simply the transfer of data, right? You know, it doesn't matter where you write it, it's gotta send it back to those modules, right? So the, the 
again, the module has two pipes out, right, and all the rest of them, right, and there's three of them that have the, the portions of the erasure code that's relevant to that write. Okay, so it has to get the data from them, do its computations, and send it back to them. Okay, and then if you imagine that I'm writing across all of them, then there's going to be three other modules who are going to have writes for which I'm one of those three. And so on average, in order to do one 4K write, I'm going to get seven pieces of data coming in, six pieces of data going out. Right? So a system that looked like it had you know, 24 gigabytes of, of bandwidth right, has got like three and a half of, it, of its 600, you know, from which I'm going to talk to 600 terabytes. Right? So I've got this system which is brand new. Right, and whose performance is going to be, you know, about where I am, but at five times the density, right? So your IOPS per gigabyte is, is a quarter from a box which is brand new versus a box which is a couple years old, right? You know, in particular, you talk about, you know, whether or not the, the performance of the system is predictable, right? You ramp up the writes, the read goes, you know, basically takes a 90% hit. Right. So now imagine if you, you know, trying to tell people what the heck they expect to get out of that system. Right. Some days it's fast, some days it it's crawls. Right. If you, you know, I'm doing any big update to it, the performance just goes completely away. So, and again, the same thing is here. Right. That write produces four, you know, three others. Right. So just in terms of what they're getting here is 4x four, four write amplification instead of 25%. Right? And again, because of the fact that it touches the stuff which is unrelated in the whole stripe, you're not going to get hot cold. And so this is the bit where um, these are limitations right, that are multiple factors. And so particularly if you want to do this stuff with commodity hardware, but that's not, you know, they're not. Right? They, to even make this work, they had to go to stuff which wasn't. Right, they had to go to, to but it's still not going to even come close to that kind of performance, right, from something which is brand new. And so this is what I mean by the, you know, as this stuff gets denser and denser and denser and denser, right, how many apps can you put in 600 terabytes? And that's raw. That wasn't even before you did your compression or, you know, other fun features which they don't have because, again, that would be really hard to do in that architecture, right? How many racks of stuff, right? How many apps do you need? Well, I'm going to guess you probably need more than they're going to give you, right? And that curve is going to keep going, right? In other words, the, the CPUs are not going to give you the performance to keep up with, right, the growth rate in the flash. And so the, you know, it looks good right now for people building this stuff out of commodities and slapping some SSDs and some NVMe and so on. It's not sustainable, right? Um, and it's not sustainable because the, you know, the benefits you can get from doing some of these things, you know, it's the, the benefits I get in hardware, right? So again, we're getting that performance from a, from a connection which is running at 20th of speed. But it further, it does things for us that you know, NVMe, SAS don't even come close to, right? We talked about the scrubbing earlier. The array self-scrubs in the sense that it doesn't do it by the array controller going and reading everything and reading it back in. The modules do, right? And then when the modules discover something that's bad, they simply talk directly to the array controller, right? Unlike an SSD, which has no idea that it's even in a RAID set, much less what the RAID controller it is, right? Every VM knows it's part of a RAID set, right? Knows it's part of the RAID controller and knows the protocol. So it just calls up the RAID controller and says, would you please rebuild this address for me, right? In hardware directly, right? No intervention. Goes and finds a, you know, a block is bad, rebuilds the block. Whole die is bad, rebuilds the die. Right? It'll find that out almost immediately. And so the, the window of vulnerability right, then becomes really small. But we can do that again because it's not a commodity protocol. Right? And so the, if I manage to get every single one of the things I wanted to get to? Yeah, largely. Right? You know, and the same thing again. This is this is this was bashing RAID six and, and erasure codes and so on. The same thing is true of all of you who are like, oh look, we've discovered that our lovely you know waffle or our log or journaling system writes you know in such a way as to not cause any write amplification whatsoever. 
Yeah, except for the fact that you have to do log cleaning, and log cleaning in a full system is, you know, horrendously <laughs> painful. Um, there's also the case that, that the notion that somehow if I write simply in blocks of the size of the, the, the flash block that I won't get any garbage collection, right, assumes that flash, you know, was digital and worked. And there's this minor problem is that the SSD, even if you write in blocks of the correct size, occasionally it's going to get an error and it's going to move stuff without telling you. Right, while you're in the middle of something and suddenly when you thought you were writing a whole block, you wind up writing a block and then it moves and half the block is written somewhere else. And suddenly, now every time you write, you're writing half of this block and half of that block. And your whole notion that you're going to prevent it from doing garbage collection just got completely wiped out. Right? Um, and there's no way that you can fix this. There's no way that you can see this. Right? It just happens underneath you. Um, and this is the difference between, again, between, you know, the reason these things work, people make the claims about, you know, it works because of our wonderful thing. No, it works because if you've got SSDs who benchmark them, you know, each individual SSD benchmarks at 70,000 IOPS, right? I mean, the whole array should do 2 million and you're getting 200,000 out of it, right? It works because you're getting 10% of the available performance, right? Anything will work. That's why pretty much all the people with those systems have about the same performance, right? Um, and so, this is also why you don't expect to see them get any faster, even though the flash didn't get denser and denser and denser, right? You can already stick, you know, 15 terabytes in one of those things, right? I could build a, a box with, you know, 300 terabytes in SSDs. Again, that and, and only 100,000 IOPS, you know, that suddenly wouldn't seem so fast, I don't think. <laughs>